So the topic today is 2017, the year for ransomware resiliency. And providing this information here, we have FishMe and Infrascale. And these two companies, we have a unique partnership in that FishMe is a leader in human phishing defense and they're providing end-to-end -end phishing mitigation solutions for more than 1,200 enterprises worldwide. And they do this by enabling incident response teams to really, really quickly research and respond to any ransomware attacks in progress. What's really interesting is that these attacks are all reported by the organization's employees who are conditioned to recognize these threats. So they'll have a lot of great information for us today and then together with InfraScale, who provides cloud backup and disaster recovery solutions, these two companies here are able to bring the strongest ransomware mitigation solutions available. Uh, InfraScale aims to give every organization the ability to recover from any disaster, including ransomware attacks, of course, quickly, easily, and affordably. And we've combined intelligent software with the power of the cloud to really crack that disaster recovery cost barrier. So we removed all the complexity and cost of standby infrastructure to restore operations in minutes with just the push of a button. So let's go ahead and get started. So who's presenting today? You're going to hear from Scott Grayo. He's the VP of Product Management for FishMe. Scott has more than 18 years of diverse information technology experience. He spent most of his career to date developing solutions to address complex information security problems. And prior to joining FishMe, Scott served as General Electric's Deputy Chief Information Security Officer. He led key global initiatives such as global anti-phishing strategy, advanced threat defense co coordination, and security awareness. And then also presenting here um, today is myself. I'm Carla Fedrigo and uh, I'm the Director of Marketing here at InfraScale. Um, Twelve years of experience here on my end, I'm, I'm focused on uh, creating effective ways to generate demand in the technology space. And uh, here at InfraScale, I lead the digital marketing efforts. So I, I see some familiar names here in our audience today from those who've attended presentations in the past. So thank you to those of you for joining us again. Um, for those of you who Scott and I have not had the opportunity to work with just yet, we look forward to working together in the near future. All right, let's take a look at the agenda and dive right in. So first off, we are gonna talk about uh, the key 2017 ransomware trends and tactics. Then we'll look at how to stop the threat of ransomware, how to mitigate the damages of downtime, and finally the Q&A with the discussion at the end. All right, and I wanted to start off with a really quick poll. So I'd love to hear from the audience. Let me just go ahead and launch this poll here, simply asking, have you uh, or your business been infected by ransomware? So that poll is up now. Wonderful. 93% have voted. Perfect, I'll give everyone just one more moment here. And then I'll go ahead and share these results. So thank you so much for your participation. This type of information always helps us to provide uh, you know, the most relevant and, and useful information to you throughout the presentation. We want to make sure we can tailor this to your needs. Now, I'm, I'm sharing the results here. It looks like 38% answering, yes, I have been a victim of ransomware. Um, and 62% no, have not experienced this type of security breach. So I'd love to hear a little bit more from those of you who answered A. You can use the question tool. Of course, any information that you share will be kept confidential, but we'd love to hear um, a little bit more. What was the situation? Did you pay the ransom? Um, anything that you'd like to, to put in there as a question or comment. And of course, again, we'll keep that confidential. Okay. So let's start here by diving into some of the key trends and, and the threat tactics that we're seeing in, in ransomware and really what your organization sh needs to be cognizant of as we move into the coming months of, of 2017. So if we look at the evolution of ransomware here, since computers have been in use, programmers have been able to create malicious software, right? Even earlier than 1986 on this graph, um, the Creeper virus was one that was created in, 
back in 71, and that was a really, really early example of just how quickly malware can spread through systems. And the proliferation of malware moved at an alarming rate. So you see the introduction of high-speed encryption. So by 2007, as much malware was produced in that single year than had been produced in the previous 20 years altogether. And then looking further towards the right, we see the rise of Bitcoin. And once that came into play, uh, then when those ransom demands hit, paying it involves a form of e-currency or cryptocurrency. And then once the attackers verify the payment, they provide the decryptor software, or at least hopefully they provide the decryptor software, right? And, and then the computer starts the long process of decrypting all your files. So since then, we've seen malware aggressively using massive email phishing campaigns to infect unknown users. And where that leaves us now is that in 2017, there's essentially two types of organizations. There's those that have been breached, and then those that have been breached but simply don't know it yet. And here are some of the most alarming trends in ransomware. They involve these, these three themes. The first is the worldwide reach. And what we see is that businesses throughout Europe, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, they've all been hit by these massive email spam campaigns carrying that malicious JavaScript attachment. And that's what installs the ransomware. Even closer to home, uh, the same thing here. Businesses were being targeted in those really similar spam attacks. Amazon.com was one last year targeted by a massive phishing campaign, and that one estimated to have sent out 30 to 100 million spam messages, just claiming to be a shopping order update. And we see more and more ransomware headlines each day. We're going to take a look at that in a second. Second uh, theme here is that it's targeting businesses. So it starts modifying all the files on your system until you get one of those messages for the ransom demand, right? And once those files are encrypted, the hackers are going to display that screen on the machine. It's just explaining uh, how to pay to unlock the files. And what, you, what we've seen is that in the past, those ransoms started in the three to $500 range, and that was for individuals. But now in 2017, companies today are being hit with ransoms in the tens of thousands of dollars. And on top of that, the ransom increases as the hours pass if you don't respond. So it's just really shocking how quickly that threat is growing. And a couple of, of quick steps. The number of ransomware attacks targeting companies increased threefold from January to September of 2016. So for, at that point in September of 2016, it was affecting one in every five businesses worldwide. And the rate of ransomware attacks against businesses increased from one in every two minutes to one in every 40 seconds during that same period. So pretty scary stuff. Finally is the network effect. So ransomware encrypts files on a single workstation, and then an even bigger problem sets in because the malware can then travel across the network and encrypt files on the network drives. And depending on the strain of ransomware at hand, the distribution works at different speeds, but it spreads like wildfire. It just moves from one machine to infecting the entire network, and one infected user can bring a whole department or an entire organization to, to a halt. So what do you have at risk if you don't have a solution? Here are the calculated averages when it comes to cost per hour of downtime. Small companies lost over $8,000 per hour, and large organizations lost $600,000 per hour. So consider what happens when a network-wide ransomware attack uh, hits. So those systems go down, even if just for an hour, you lose all communication with your business partners, customers, employees, so how would you deal with this type of situation? And more importantly, do you know how much that outage would cost you in terms of lost opportunity? So of course, uh, here at Infraskill, we wouldn't take that risk, and neither would Fish Me. <laughs> so Scott, do you want to take it from here and share some more stats? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Carla. You know, the, the reality of the impact of ransomware, it, it is staggering, uh, like you were saying earlier. Um, and, and actors are seeing that most victims are willing to pay. So they're, they're simply increasing the demands. And that, you know, what we've seen is about a 2x increase there. It's such a simple supply and demand type model that they're they're, they're taking advantage of. So it's it's uh, it's an interesting twist on um, on old models. Uh, the other thing that's good to note is that since the attackers don't really care about your industry, they're not trying to get at your intellectual property. Is that nobody uh, is immune to this epidemic? Everyone is at risk, and so that you know we all have to be thinking about you know we are a target. So it's, it's much more, if we look at the headlines, we're seeing that all industries are under attack. And it's pretty interesting, you know, you look at this, the diversity here. Um, it, ransomware, it really is everywhere. And organizations may not be prepared to deal with this style of phishing attack. And if they're not, they have some very difficult decisions to make. Like you were mentioning earlier, do I pay the ransom? Do I not? Do I have a good strategy in place to be able to deal with this? So, you know, it, it, there's a couple questions that people should be thinking about throughout today's discussion uh, is whether or not you have a plan in place to deal with a ransomware attack. And, um, and then how would you actually respond to that? How do you initiate that when it actually happens? So. Uh, Carla, I think it's a great opportunity for another poll here. Yeah, sounds good. All right, let's bring up another poll here. And this next poll simply asking, do you have a process to analyze suspicious emails reported by your employees? A, yes, but it's mostly manual. B, yes, but it's mostly automated. And then C, not sure. And so far, we're, we're basically spit, split nearly 50-50 with A and B. Let's see, 86% of you have voted. I'll give everyone another moment here. Great. All right, let me go ahead and close this down and share the results. We've got 58% saying yes, but it's mostly manual. 42% yes, and it's mostly automated. That's some really great information. Um, uh, so thanks to everyone uh, who's attending today. You know, I, I think that's it's going to lead well into the next part of the discussion here. Um, as we think about, you know, how, how as an information security community can we better respond to uh, not just ransomware attacks but phishing attacks in general because they're it's part of that larger uh, that macro set. And so how do we do that? So, you know, uh, a lot of you probably joined today weren't thinking that you'd hear a lot about prairie dogs, but I want to talk a little bit about that and some collective security models that exist out there that may be able to help us all in what we do day in and day out to better respond to this type of attack. You know, if I think about this collective security concept, you know, really the goal is to increase the security of the overall or the larger group by collaboration. Uh, we see this model used by governments. You know that, that could be at the international level. Are we trying to find, you know, uh, actors that are, are terrorists or other uh, or other things like that uh, to the local level with first responders? So we see government using a collective security uh, model quite often. Um, but the interesting question is, to me, is what would happen if we started to apply this kind of model to what we do in business? And you know, in the past, it's been called crowdsourcing, and I think it's a great, it's a great way for us to look because, as we see this concept, it, it is gaining some momentum, uh, and I'll get to more about that in a bit. Um, but right now, I really, I think you guys are really excited to learn more about prairie dogs. So I'd like to tell you a few interesting facts about uh, about these cool animals. Um, you may not know this, but the prairie dog is actually the, like the American cousin to the meerkat. Uh, we just think it has a cooler name. Uh, and these animals exhibit some pretty uh, peculiar behavior, uh, as it may appear to some people. They make these interesting noises. There's a lot of chatter. There's a lot of up and down 
on their legs. Uh, and, you know, what they're doing as they make these series of calls, that they're communicating with others um, in their community. So they're trying to tell each other things. And the chi noises that they make are most often used to warn others in their group of, of impending danger. Uh, and so in effect, the, this is a bit of a blueprint for that collaborative security model. You know, uh, as we think about what governments or, or local entities may do, they're telling each other about things that they're seeing so that, again, they can affect a greater um, security to the, to the collaborative. We see the same type of behavior with, uh, with the uh, prairie dog, which is pretty neat. So if one member says that something bad is happening, what they're doing is they're effectively enabling others to react uh, to a potential threat and safeguard the community. And I promise you guys, I, I'm not making this up. Um, there are some researchers that, uh, and sciences, uh, scientists that completely devote their entire livelihood to researching the communication habits of, of prairie dogs, and Khan's a great example of this. And it's, it's actually fascinating uh, what these animals can do. And, you know, they're very smart. So if we think about intelligence from the animal kingdom, Typically, a lot of people, we think about dolphins uh, and, uh, and their complex communication habits. But, but I have to let you know that prairie dogs, they really do rival the, the saltwater friends. And they're able to share very unique attributes about threats that they're seeing or things that they're observing uh, in the world around them. The, the scientists like Khan who study them, they've been able to identify um, several different calls and what they actually mean and what they're communicating. And now they understand that there's a level of complexity that they really do inject into their communication stream, into these cheese. And it could be anything from physical attributes about the threat. It could be, that's the size, you know, it's a tall human, or it's a tall animal, or it's a short animal, or it's a fox, uh, to, uh, to things about like adornments. So when it comes to people, they've noticed that the chino is change and they can start to tell you attributes about their clothing. You know, the color of a shirt, the size of the pants, are they long pants or short pants? Are they holding a gun? Which might be another threat indicator. Um, and so the, the, these plant-sized friends of ours, they make it a point to provide as much relevant information about a threat as they can, as they're perceiving. Even more interesting uh, is that they're really trying to pass on these facts so that others, again, in their community can make informed decisions. So it's not always saying that there's an active threat, it's just saying that here's some interesting information that I'm observing and maybe we should think about this as a community. So the, the, the last thing I think that is really cool about this is that anyone can sound the alarm. And again, I think that's where the collective security model starts to hit the home runs is that we're not relying on the experts always. We're just relying on intelligence and information from informants. Uh, and, and in this case, it's our prairie dog informants. So that's a pretty neat thing that they're able to do there. Um, and I'm sure at this point in the conversation, there's probably people asking in the chat here that I haven't looked at that are wondering, although this is really cool talking about, uh, uh, about the, the meerkat cousin, um, how does this help me with ransomware, Scott? So it's a valid question. And so the one thing I'd like to submit for your consideration is wh why don't we follow the meerkats lead? Why don't we adopt a collective security model? Um, why do our defenses typically rely on just the, the brain power of hardware and software engineers instead of the collective uh, cranial mass of everyone in our community, be it our organization, peer organizations, partner organizations? I think we have a lot to learn by this model and a way to accelerate what we're actually doing out here in the real world. So, you know, I think about this you know, the way I see it, maybe this is just an artifact of, of we as people, you know, our, our desire to build perfect systems. Um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of engineers day in and day out, and their goal is to bubble wrap uh, the, the, the humans in their organization because they're the problem. I have a perfect design. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't, really, it doesn't really get the net effect that they're looking for. Um, and we've spent decades blaming people for all of the technical issues when, in reality, if we simply, simply engaged people in our organizations and made them part of the solution set, I think we'd be well ahead of the game. <laughs> it, this isn't to say that we shouldn't invest in technology. Technology is a critical part of what we do day in and day out. Um, 
these solutions do help us with our uh, collective security model, but instead we have to embrace the fact that we've hired smart people around us and we can tap into them as a resource and they add a ton of value to the overall system. And I'll talk more about that uh, in the coming slides. You know, just taking a peek back, you know, th there's more statistics that I think should that should alarm everyone. I was actually watching a webinar earlier today, uh, and th there was a CISO who presented at, at uh, RSA earlier this year, and, and she was talking exactly the same talk track. Like this, this data should be horrifying to most of us, and and I couldn't agree more. You know, if I look at the metrics on this page, it should make us uncomfortable. Um, and if we even look at some metrics that aren't here, you know, spear phishing continues to be the weapon of choice for that initial entry uh, into an organization by threat actors. Um, and with over 90% of all successful breaches starting with that attack vector, another concerning fact is the amount of damage that the emails cause. And you know, we're starting to get better insight in this because newer regulations are forcing public companies to tell us about this in their financial reporting. So we're learning a lot more about the impact of successful attacks, the things that we, we prob probably did not know in the past. Um, my prediction here just is that actors, they're going to continue to take advantage of phishing just because of its historical success. Uh, so that's not going to go away for us, and I'm pretty sure that no one's abandoning email here in the near future. So we'll continue to see email-based attacks being uh, a reality for organizations, and ransomware is just another, another twist on a successful uh, method here. So, you know, I'd love to give you an example of, of how an attacker gets around your technical controls because I think that's really important for us all to understand. It, it, again, in, investment in new technologies is really important, but a lot of times we see these point solutions and attackers, you know, you have to think about them. They're clever, they're clever human beings and all they're doing is trying to attack you know, your organization and get around these technical controls we put in place. That's why it's important for us to engage with the humans. So, you know, what we see here is that an attacker might just lob in uh, a zipped up uh, payload. Um, and what they're doing here in this payload, so they compress it, um, and uh, that makes it a little bit harder for your technology to find. And then inside of that compressed file, uh, attackers are clever. So they, they use some clever naming conventions and, and make it compelling for the individual to open up that file. Um, and all this file does, it's, these are called droppers or downloaders. They, its goal is then to go retrieve the malware and bring it down to the platform. But, you know, if I work in finance, invo invoice uh, copy, even though I may not see that it's a JavaScript file or understand what that even means, that could be compelling for me to interact with. And so then what happens next is just like most malware, it's going to go ahead and download uh, its payload. In this uh, example, it's crypto wall. And then it starts to do the things that Carlo was talking about earlier. Uh, and it's told to, in this example, it's told to encrypt everything it can access, be it on your local computer, um, network attached, uh, attached storage, anything it has access to, it's going to try to encrypt because that's the, the goal of these ransomware attacks. And then if Carlo kind of hinted at this earlier, you know, these threat actors, they're super nice people. They leave you instructions because they want to get paid. Um, so sometimes they're going to present an image every time you log in. Sometimes they'll reset your background or your screensaver. They want you to know how to pay them uh, because that's their end goal. They don't care if you lose your data or you don't. They don't want your data. They just want the money. So it's a pretty interesting um, uh, method. And if you think about the attack that we just went through, it's not that complex. Uh, at the end of the day, they just combined a few simple tactics uh, to help them evade technical controls that most organizations may have. Um, and then a lot of organizations just lack that, that uh, the conditioned humans who could identify and then properly report these types of attacks. So I, I think that's the, the place that I'd like to focus on is how do we get there? You know, we think about uh, things like the kill chain uh, in, in information security. This is always a big, uh, a big thing that's shown in a lot of slides. Um, you know, the goal of a lot of the programs out there is to stop attacks earlier in the kill chain. Uh, but based on data, folks, we're not, we're not doing well. If you look at these numbers here, again, these are more of those scary for the CISO numbers. Uh, and even if on the low end, that 56 days, to me, it's just too much time to allow an attacker to hang out on your network um, before they start exfil exfiltrating data. 
Uh, and in the case of ransomware, it doesn't even take them that long. They start encrypting things on day zero. Uh, but this isn't traditional attacks. Um, <laughs> you know, we can take the models that we're trying to apply to the larger phishing issue to help us with ransomware. And again, a lot of what uh, other, uh, other technologies are focused on is that action, that exfiltration piece. What, what I would like to see more organizations adopt is that we can stop this at delivery. Uh, and our collective security approach can reduce the success rate and, and minimize the impact of an attack because we have people who are telling us about it as it's happening. And Carla's going to share more about, you know, again, what you can do on the technical side to help improve uh, response. But I'll talk a, a few minutes about, you know, FishMe's approach to collective security. You know, really uh, our big uh, goal here is what we call human phishing defense. You know, we think about, we have people in our organization, I talked about this earlier, your peers, I'm pretty sure most organizations aren't hiring uh, people who they feel are, are not very smart or intelligent. We have people who are experts in their domains. So how do we latch, uh, uh, how do we connect with them and condition them to be able to identify and report messages so that we can react, uh, react to those through our security operations processes? And, and we do this through a multi-pronged approach. It's kind of a four-legged stool. Uh, the first thing that we, uh, we do is we help condition employees to identify and properly respond to in-progress phishing attacks. We do this through simulation. Um, if we can provide a safe environment in which, someone, uh, in which someone can interact with a phishing email, I'm using air quotes, and, and be that, you know, it could be a, a drive-by that has a URL, credential theft, it could be malware. You know, once they start to understand what these actually look like, we can help condition them on what they're supposed to do and providing really good reporting back to the operators of this platform so they can understand trends that they're seeing within their organization, maybe unique attributes or unique uh, motivators that, uh, that get their employees to respond to these types of attacks so that they can tune their program and continue to condition people to identify and report these suspicious emails. The next thing that we have to do is provide, just like anything else, any other function that you have in business, uh, you know, the goal is to provide business productivity solutions. Um, in the past, I remember having to explain to someone how to report a suspicious email to the Security Operations Center, and there was a, it was a one-page document, and although it wasn't really complex, it just appeared to be complex. Uh, people want easy buttons. They want easy solutions to their problems. And so if we don't provide them something like this, it's an Outlook add-in, it's a one click and then I can tell someone that I'm seeing something that's unusual. If we don't give them this, they reach for another easy button, which is the delete button on their keyboard because that gets this thing out of their view and they don't have to worry about it anymore. But this definitely doesn't give us the good information that we need. So as soon as we start to enable uh, our employees to be able to respond properly, we not only collect more information about potential attacks against our organization, but we start to get it in a structured format that's really easy for our security operations teams to consume and make use of. And that, that goes well into the next part of this, you know, that, well, you know what, Scott, I'm going to cross my arms and glower at you because people are stupid. Eh, again, I go back. I don't think any of us hire stupid people on purpose or, or set out with that goal and objective in mind. And what we're seeing is that employees are really in tune and focused on their email. And if we start to listen to the people on the left side of this chart, these are people who are telling us about problems before the problem's a problem. Uh, they're telling us about attacks before the attack was successful. If we start to do that, we start to see success. That means we can re react proactively to problems, uh, especially in the phishing space. And I would be a liar if I told you everyone's going to be in that space. You know, you see that big chunk to the left there. You know, some of the prairie dogs, I promise you folks, they're not going to make it. Um, they will they will be caught up to and you know it's an unfortunate fact of life but when we have all that great intelligence coming in ahead of time and even after a successful attack it allows your organization to contain and react better to this and I'll show a slide here in a couple that, that talks about the ROI I mean that's really at the end of the day we're trying to save money right that's what most of us are here to help our companies do if we're asked about the value we provide so that's the big goal um, you know, what we're doing here, though, once we condition employees to identify and report, is we're generating a lot of information. 
uh, that information has to be analyzed. So we need a platform like our triage platform that helps our, our security operations teams to be able to organize all these new incoming uh, threat reports into clusters, uh, similar emails, so that they can then analyze those en masse. You know, we talked earlier about investment in other technologies. My goal is to help you extract more value out of that. And so that's, that's, this is a great example. You're going to go pivot into your sandbox or your other uh, platform and understand more attributes about this cluster of messages that help you make informed decisions. And then last but not least, be able to respond to all these people who are reporting as well as respond upstream uh, into your security operations playbooks. Maybe you want to start blocking certain IP addresses or blocking emails from certain domains. You know, this is really a phishing incident response platform that allows your security operations teams to automate a lot of that process that they go through today. And, you know, last but not least, you know, intelligence is, is vital. So, you know, the, the three things I talked about earlier are really helping you corral and create intelligence about things that are definitely happening within your network, but it's always good to know about things that are happening outside of your network. And so, you know, we, we like to provide uh, our our uh, intelligence product here, which is 100% human verified, 100% uh, phishing specific intel, effectively works a lot the way that the, the uh, triage platform works. We take uh, emails that are uh, collected through our honeypots, we correlate those and, and, uh, and put them into clusters, we do some baseline analysis and then we bubble up what are high prob uh, probability threats and we drop those into an analyst queue so that they can look at that. So a human then reverses it, they determine what the, uh, the indicators of compromise are, they determine what the indicators of phishing are, and we push out all, these different, uh, all this different information both to our customers so you can use it as part of your operation, as well as into triage so you can identify maybe you've already been attacked and people are telling you about it. And then the last thing we do, which is pretty cool, is we take the story, that email, that content, which is usually disposable in most... Uh, uh, in most other uh, aspects of security, but then we push that into the simulation platform so that our customers can real-time uh, inoculate their workforce to active threats that are going out there, going on out there in the wild. So, pretty neat concept. And, you know, I, I did promise that I'd talk a little bit about the, kind of the overall ROI. The, the reason we do all these things as, as, uh, uh, as folks in the security space it's because we're passionate about protecting our organizations. Uh, but I mentioned this earlier, you know, if I think about the end state goal, someone somewhere is going to ask you, is this saving us money? Is it enabling us to go into new hostile environments or make more money as a company? And that's really the key here. How can we identify and respond to real attacks faster? And if we start to look at that overall investment that you're gonna put into any platform, it's great to see that there's an ROI there. So this is a pretty neat study that came out recently from Forrester. I don't know if we put this one out into the uh, into the handouts, but you guys can definitely visit the, our website if you wanted to get more information on this. But the goal is how do we save money over time? How do we really, uh, really react to this larger phishing problem, not just the ransomware one, and provide a good return to our, uh, to our organizations? So with that, I, I, Carla, I think it would be great to pass it back over to you to talk more about how to mitigate the damages of, of downtime uh, in the event that that does happen to your organization. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, such useful information for, for organizations there. And who would have thought that somehow prairie dogs could help us with ransomware? I love it. Um, so now that we have a, a really good solid understanding of the current threat status of ransomware and and, and how to stop ransomware uh, from coming in by conditioning end users um, with, that, with that phishing defense, let's sort of sw switch gears, talk a little bit about the other side of the coin. So what if it's already too late to prevent that ransomware infection? Or what if, what if the damage has already been done um, and, and you don't have that proactive um, phishing defense in place? So, of course, like, like Scott just mentioned, you know, in a perfect world, nobody is going to click on a malicious link in a phishing email. Um, but if that were the case, then ransomware wouldn't even be an issue. So we all want to be responsible computer users, and, and we are, but, but like he said, you know, we're hiring smart employees. 
the thing is hackers can be really smart too and so we're all susceptible people people get tricked so that's why FishMe and Infrascale came together today you know your first line of defense is your anti-phishing solution and then your second line of defense is a backup and recovery solution and you want one that can restore your data and systems to a clean environment and have you operating normally within minutes not days like it would take to decrypt um, and you know recover on top of that ransom payment what we're going to do now then is take a look at how backup and disaster recovery can protect you but you have to do it right there are several factors here in defense against data hijacking and first is with your end users like Scott discussed we we know we want to know how to recognize those phishing attacks and suspicious links or emails and then admins should be testing the end user knowledge with those simulations like you mentioned and then second is the antivirus or anti-malware you, you want to try to reach that before it takes hold in your systems but your third line of defense is going to have a backup and disaster recovery solution in place so Generally speaking, having a backup of that data, any backup system will do. You just want to keep in mind first, you want it to allow you to roll back to a date before the ransomware hit. So you need that file history or that versioning capability before, uh, before you put that solution in place. You want it built in. So you don't want to get stuck with a backup solution in place that doesn't keep versions of your files. That's really going to be no use to you when it comes time to actually recover. And you want it to back up your data and your system, so not just files and folders on your individual machine. Since we know now ransomware will work itself through your network, um, like we talked about earlier, it spreads like wildfire to the whole organization. We generally know we should be backing up all of our data, but usually organizations aren't sufficiently protecting all of it because we have that mission critical data, it's core to the business, we have applications that the business can't run without, we also have remote branch offices and then end users, end users with their laptops, mobile devices, all of the data on those devices, which by the way, cyber criminals are infecting as well. So security firms recently have, have found that hackers are increasingly using mobile malware in order to expand the, the number of potential targets outside of PCs. Even compared with last year, there are over four times as many users being attacked by mobile ransomware. So even though we know we should be doing this, we should be protecting all of this data, organizations generally have a priority based on the value of the data. So if it's not mission critical, it's likely not sufficiently protected. And that's what remains an issue because hackers are going to look for any way in possible. And that's really leaving, leaving your organization susceptible to infection. So what you really want is a cloud-based solution that's going to keep everything in a secure central location. You can recover whatever you need at any time. And then not only will it let you recover without having to pay the ransom, but here at Infrascale, we're even going beyond just that traditional backup and recovery. We've introduced a proactive warning alert system specifically for ransomware. It's what we call anomaly detection. So this is a snapshot of anomaly detection in our dashboard. What, what the technology does, so we're monitoring the backup activity. We're looking at all the patterns of data change. In other words, we're looking at how frequently the data is changing. So we know when ransomware gets into your system, it's modifying all of the files that it touches. So if it's a file that you're backing up, we're going to recognize it as a changed file. And in this change rate analysis, we're monitoring the, no the number of normally changed files per day. And then if suddenly we see a spike, like you see here on, on the right, if you see a spike where there's a much larger number of files that have been changed, that's when the alert gets released. So here you can proactively see the threat of data encryption by hackers before the ransom is ever posted or ever demanded, right? And when we send the alerts out to the admins, you can detect the issue before the threat ever hits. So that way you can roll back to a clean data environment faster 
obviously far less data loss, avoid paying those high ransoms. And this is really important because none of the other BDR solutions out there today have this proactive warning system in place. Most of them are going to say, you know, we can't detect it, but we can remediate it. Well, we're able to do both. And backup in, re in recovery, just historically, um, traditional disaster recovery is, you know, it's, BDR is a great solution for file and folder data, but we want to look at the whole network systems, right? So we know that malware strains can scan and encrypt not only the data on the devices and mapped drives, but unmapped drives are at risk as well if the virus is able to access those shares. So once it's gained access to the network systems, the best defense strategy moves from backup to DR, or disaster recovery, in order to get everyone back up and running quickly. So backup and DR used to be one and the same. It started with off-site tape backup. And if a system went down, you had to go get the tape, uh, rebuild and restore that way. And that solution would take several days at best you know, two to five days would be, would be a great recovery time, or RTO. Uh, but it was very cheap. So then came cloud backup and appliance backup systems. Very similar idea to tape, just more modern technology. So you'd recover the data, then uh, recover the systems, and then you need to rebuild and restore and get the, the end users back up that way. So you can see the RTO or recovery time improvement here. It went from days to hours, but it was more costly as well. And if you had a need for an even quicker recovery time, if you need to recover in minutes or seconds, then you moved to having a second data center. So a second data center might be a cold site, a warm site, or a hot site, each costing more and more, but bringing your recovery time to seconds or minutes instead of hours or days. But the problem with traditional disaster recovery to date is that trade-off between recovery time and cost. So for each improvement level in RTO, your cost goes up substantially. And if you're a large organization, maybe you have that budget, you can afford that. If you're a medium enterprise or a small to medium business, you just don't have that budget. So the question's always been, is there a way to offer disaster recovery functionality, but at the cost of backup? So now the answer is yes, with DRAZ. So DRAZ is disaster recovery as a service, and that's a solution that can bring your recovery time down to just mere seconds without the excessive cost. So DRAZ is going to let you quickly fail over your data and systems. It really supports DR to be on demand with just the push of a button. And here's a, a little bit of a more detailed way to look at the difference between backup and DRAZ. So with backup, and whether we're talking about tape or disk, you're capturing the data and systems, you're storing the backups somewhere off-site, and then when a ransomware attack occurs, you need to physically go retrieve that tape or that hard drive and restore to the original systems. And then when that's done, you're back up and running. And so that's what takes multiple days or hours, right? Along the bottom here, you see uh, with disaster recovery that we've reversed the order of the run and restore operations. So we've captured the full system images, the same as we did before, but now the difference here, we can directly boot and run that image either locally or in the cloud. So the result here is you can run directly from a backup and you have the users operational and running within minutes. So here's a scenario to actually see it in action. So in this first situation, here are some end users they're working on their production systems, and then we'll install the InfraScale disaster recovery solution. So it's a hybrid cloud solution. You've got an on-premise failover appliance installed locally, and this could be a virtual appliance or a physical appliance. And then you have a cloud-based service, like would run on any public or private cloud. So we'll capture the systems to the appliance, dedupe them to compress the amount of data that's stored, 
We're going to replicate those systems up to the cloud. So now we have two copies of those systems, one locally on the appliance, and we have one centrally located on the cloud. So if one of those systems were to go down, the administrator could fail over to the local appliance and bring up the most recent point or replica of that system, and then the end users continue working with that application or that server. Now, let's assume there's a site-wide uh, infection after a ransomware attack. So the local appliance is no longer available, none of your systems are available, and that's okay because we'll still use the same steps here and with just a few clicks, we'll be able to roll back to that clean environment and fail over instead to the cloud. So here we're gonna bring up a full virtual environment that replicates exactly what was on premise and now those users continue working by interacting with those cloud-based systems. And one of the key differentiators with any DR solution provider is going to be how to deliver orchestration. So I want to touch quickly on this. And orchestration meaning the, the orderly recovery of a server environment, right? So it's going to ensure that your critical servers, applications, all of your devices, everything comes back online in the proper sequence based on dependencies. And you also want it to allow you to completely restore your networking configuration on the DR site as well. So our latest release here introduced this visual designer for drag and drop orchestration like you see here. And this is within our dashboard. It's under our boot tab. You can see a page for orchestration. And you see on the left a list of all of the bootable machines. And then you can simply drag them over to the diagram design surface. So you can rearrange them, drag and drop, add wait times if you want delays between boots. You can create boot groups to run, so that way if, if some machines are more critical than others and you want to separate them out, you can do that. And then you can specify the network configuration settings for the machines as well. So within the LAN configuration, you specify the subnet, gateway, DNS servers, DHCP range, you can enable or disable outbound internet access. And uh, along the bottom here, you, you always have that usage bar of the free versus used space. So you always know uh, exactly what your capacity and your usage is at any point in time. And this is really critical. So no matter what DR solution you use, it's just really important to understand exactly how the solution plans to fill over your application and then fill back. Uh, in addition to, to how much customization you have, how much control you have for the whole orchestration process. So really regardless of who you choose for DR, just keep that in mind and those questions are just really important to ask your provider. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what we do here at Infrascale with all of that in mind. So, our mission is to eradicate downtime and data loss, of course, uniquely fits in with ransomware mitigation because ransomware threatens both of these. So it threatens data loss if you don't pay the ransom. It immediately causes downtime from the point which the ransom hits until you resolve the, the situation. And like Scott was, was saying, that could take 56 days and that's on the low end, right? So we don't advise anyone to pay the ransom because complying with those ransomware criminals just opens the door to future attacks. So this is where disaster recovery as a service fits in. And with our DRAZ offering, we can bring back your entire network, hundreds of computers within 15 minutes or less guaranteed. And compare that with some of the big guys out there, the IBMs of the world, the best that they can guarantee you is two hours. And generally, they're charging about five times the cost. Uh, in addition to that, we guarantee a 15-minute failover, and we deliver that on-demand cloud-backed DR as a service for the price of backup, which nobody out there can offer. And we're doing this with just using intelligent software, built-in deduplication, compression, and WAN acceleration technologies, We've eliminated costly hardware, so you can bolt on an unlimited amount of cloud space, and that's using intelligent cloud spillover that we do that. So 
InfraSkills can let you save about 70% in comparison to others. It's a low monthly subscription. It's all based on the number of terabytes protected. So you're only paying for what you protect. And we're doing this with two services mostly. So cloud backup and disaster recovery. And those services enable you to uh, protect endpoints. They'll protect you from ransomware like we talked about with anomaly detection. And so InfraScale Cloud Backup is that direct to cloud solution it's oriented around data and bare metal image backup. So it's typically for endpoint uh, data protection for laptops, mobile devices. InfraScale Disaster Recovery is a hybrid cloud solution. It includes an on-premise component like we just saw, as well as a cloud component. And to get a sense of the specifics, this matrix is going to show everything that we do and what we can support. So the columns are essentially di the different services and devices that we protect, and the rows are the use cases. So we're backing up and recovering O365 and other cloud services, iPhones, Android, desktops, laptops across Windows and Mac, and then DR as a service comes in to support physical and virtual servers on Windows, Unix, Linux, uh, virtual servers on VMware, Hyper-V, and KVM. So this is really the broadest support footprint that you'll find in the industry. And along the bottom here, as far as recovery targets, we support any cloud and a prepackaged appliance as well. So you can use one of InfraScale's 15 global data centers, or you can use your own private cloud if you have your own infrastructure, or you can use third-party clouds. So our software runs with AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, and IBM Software or Bluemix. And I see we have just a, we have about five minutes left here, so I'm just sort of speeding through these last couple of slides, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. Um, in terms of scale, this map is showing our global coverage. So each red dot represents a business that we protect, and we're currently active in over 170 countries. We're protecting over a million devices and counting. And those 15 uh, data centers that I just mentioned, the, the geographically dispersed data centers, are protecting over 100 petabytes of data across our global grid. So this approach is really getting a lot of attention. Um, leading analyst firm Gartner, they named us the 2015 cool vendor in business continuity and disaster recovery. And then in 2016, they named us a visionary in disaster recovery as a service. Now, FishMe is also recognized as a leader by Gartner. Um, Scott, do you want to share some information about FishMe's organization? Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, just to keep it brief, our technology was first started back in about 2008. Um, we uh, were out in uh, headquartered out of uh, Washington, D.C. We have offices throughout the world. You know, you had mentioned it earlier, Carla, our focus is really to help customers of any size, and that's a, that's a big thing that we've been focused on over the past couple of years. Um, you know, our, our initial focus was on large enterprise, but we're really starting to pivot there. We want to help our, our uh, smaller business uh, customers out there, because we understand that there's a lot of opportunity uh, to to uh, realize the same benefits as everyone else. We've been recognized by things like the SE Awards the, or the Inc. 5000, Deloitte Fi, uh, Fast 500. Um, also, Gartner's, uh, uh, Gartner's um, Magic Quadrant for Security Awareness and CBT, uh, we were named the leader there. And it, it's, been, uh, it's been a lot of fun for us. And, you know, the way I look at it is really our focus here is how do we save our customers money at the end of the day? You know, how, how do we get you guys uh, to a better place, protect yourself uh, better against not just ransomware but all phishing attacks, and, and so that you can uh, be successful in your endeavors as an organization? Great. You guys, we have one more uh, quick poll here, <laughs> and we've only got a minute or two. Um, and we will be, I want to be respectful of your time here, and uh, we will keep this to an hour. But last poll, would you like to learn more about FishMe Human Phishing Defense, InfraScale Disaster Recovery and Cloud Backup, uh, both FishMe and InfraScale Solutions, or not interested in either, either solution right now, just learning? And I'll give everyone a moment to reply there. And while this poll is up here, 
we do have one more uh, one more slide here for you guys. Just with the next steps, if you'd like to move forward uh, with FishMe and or InfraScale, we'd love to offer everyone on the line here today, of course, thank you for joining us, and we'd like to offer a, a complimentary one-on-one -on -one demo. If you take advantage of this one-on-one -on -one demo uh, with FishMe, you're also going to receive a CB Freeze, free computer-based trainings. And with InfraScale, you're also going to receive a free $500 cloud backup credit. So if you'd like to take advantage of those complimentary one-on-one -on -one demos along with those, uh, the CB freeze or the free $500 credit, you can use the question tool and just type in demo one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. You can just let us know in there in that question tool. And we've got about 80% of you have voted so far on this poll, so let me go ahead and close that poll down. Thank you for your participation in that. And then here's the info that I was just discussing on the the one-on-one -on -one demos and the free computer-based trainings or the $500 cloud backup credit. Now, we are right on the hour, so I think what we'll have to do, Scott, should we just say um, any of the questions that came through, uh, we will reach out to you via email in order to provide an answer for those questions that came through. We've run out of time today, unfortunately. Apologies for that. Um, but if you'd like to take advantage of, of that one-on-one that -on -one demo and um, these next steps here, just use the question tool to type in let us know. And then we'll be following up with you for those questions that come in. Scott, do you, does that work for you as well? Yeah, absolutely. I want to be respectful of, of everyone's time here. Thanks for joining us today, folks. Yeah, guys. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We very much look forward to working with you in the future. Keep an eye out for an email from us uh, to follow up with you on all of that. Thank you so much. Have a great day.